The Doctor's Eyes Only podcast community knows that life is multidimensional and creating wealth that matters goes beyond the balance sheet. Join us twice monthly to hear from inspirational physician guests and subject matter experts with unique insights for physicians in both life and business. Glean clear takeaways to improve your life and medical practice starting today and leave inspired to live your own wealth that matters. Hello, everyone. I'm here with my co-host, Cameron. Hello. And we want to welcome you to another episode of the Doctor's Eyes Only podcast. We appreciate your patience as we did take a bit of a break at the end of last year. We're so excited to be back in 2022, and we're excited about the episodes that we have lined up, which will continue to add value to your practice and share meaningful stories from doctors just like you. The idea for today's episode actually came from a conversation that I had with a surgeon client of mine. He runs a solo practice and was lamenting to me in one of our conversations, he was dealing with a bit of a revolving door when it came to his right-hand staff person for his practice. As we talked, it became clear to me that what he was really in need of was a great hiring process, which is really clear to me with my business background, but in medicine, as we know, you all don't always get the best training on how to run a business. So he had no idea what went into building a hiring process and what he needed to tweak in order to find that reliable right-hand person. I immediately started helping him with tools that he could use to level up his hiring game. A lot of that was based on what I have learned from today's guest, Brad Quick. Brad is actually a partner of Cameron and mine at our financial planning company, Vestia. He's not a financial advisor. He serves as our president and COO. He came to us with a rich background in orthopedic sales and has 20 plus years of experience building great teams at the likes of GE, Depew, and most recently Zimro Biomet. So I'm very excited to glean even more of Brad's wisdom for you today that you can apply to your own medical practice. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. Love being here. So the first thing I want to know, Brad, is talk to me a little bit about why is it important to be intentional or thoughtful about building your team versus just hiring the first person that fits the job role that you need to fill? Great question, Cam. The the first why here is really, it's just, it's great business. When you read through something like a good to great, or when you look at the, how GE under Jack Welch did you see that talent was a massive part of that. So the good to great example, having the right people on the bus, that was something consistent across all these companies that outperformed all their peers in the market. So really good business to have great people on the bus. Secondly, just from a personal selfish standpoint, the, the what's in it for me, I, I had an example where early in my career, it was uh, my 10 year anniversary I took with my wife and I left and I was on a cruise ship for about a week, completely without email, without cell coverage. And as you can expect, as I'm heading back home, I had a a bunch of anxiety around, boy, there's going to be so much to do when I got back. Mm -hmm. Well, I had an amazing team and that showed up when I got back, I had about five emails and about three things to do. My team absolutely owned that. And so the, the aha moment for me is doing more of that, it gives me the kind of life I want to live. And really, you know, just getting the right people on the bus can make a massive impact to your business. That's awesome. So it seems before you've actually done it right before you've actually built the team, it seems like a new hire should be as easy as you identify the position that you're hiring for. So you've got this job description of what they actually do. And then you look for someone that has experience and checks those boxes. Is that all that there is to it? Or are there other things that we should be thinking about when we're trying to build the profile that we're hiring to? Yeah. So what I've learned for me in in my 20 plus, and thank you for that. It's actually closer to 30 years of experience is that I want to keep you young. Rounding thank down. You. I, I seriously appreciate that. I have to color my gray hair. <laughs> what I've learned in interviewing, and I've had courses in interviewing, I've had a lot of experience doing it. And there's a whole lot of conventional wisdom. The biggest thing there I found is it's really literally a roll of the dice. Some people are slightly better than others at discerning in an interview, should they hire, but I've been proven wrong more than once. And so in order, the best way to hire talent is one to hire somebody who worked for you in the past, who was amazing 
and to hire them again in a setting that's similar to the one they were in. Absent that, you have to stack the deck somehow. So what I've learned is that there is a really great correlation between wiring. So the way that I'm wired, the way that you're wired and position, what's required in that position. And so that's a big part of our very formal process that we use to, to onboard new talent is making sure that that's aligned. So an example of that is if you are great, if you're an extrovert, if you're driven, we found that that kind of personality for finding new business is super helpful. But if you are really bad at details, for example, and you're in a position that requires a lot of detail work, that is something that you're not naturally going to be very good at. And some of those personality profiles, and we use insights, are really good at helping make sure that you have the right kind of personality coming into a position. Yeah. And there's a few different versions of those. I know I've encountered in the past, you mentioned insights, there's the disc profile, there's the Colby. There's a lot of different ways to do that. I think the aha moment, Brad, when you introduced our company to insights is I have always had trouble in the past in an interview scenario people always tell me what I want to hear. (laughs) There is a little bit of leading the witness that inevitably goes on in the course of an interview, where if I'm a driven individual and I'm looking for someone who's driven, they're probably going to tell me that they are. What insights or whatever kind of profile you use does is it helps you to validate that they are actually wired the way that they portray to you that they're wired. So I think to your comment about stacking the deck, you're giving yourself a better probability (laughs) of that hire actually being who you think they are, as opposed to just who they told you that they are. Absolutely. What we all learned, if you remember back to school, which again is further away from some of us and others, what did all your counselors do as you're graduating? They prepped you for interviews. Here's answers to typical questions. You want to tell them this, you want to tell them you're driven, you want to run the company someday. And so super easy to prep for answers and rehearse those and be very adept at an interview, which again, exactly the reason why you want to have the wiring thing, because then you can be very specific. Oh, it looks like being organized isn't your natural wiring. Tell me how you overcome that. So really different discussions versus, Hey, how organized are you? Well, I'm very organized. Thanks for asking. I think the other thing is like attracts like, in a sense. And so I know when I'm sitting across the interview table from someone, I tend to think if I see myself in that person, I tend to think that's a good thing. Something else that I've learned over time is that I may actually need someone in a certain position to fill in my gaps (laughs) more than I need them to be another me. Absolutely. I was going to add the other thing that I thought was really, I think it's really powerful. And something that I really appreciate about our hiring process is that we vet them using our current team members. So to your point, Lauren, you want to make sure that there's a good complement to what you're doing right now, but then you also want to see that their colleagues, their their people that are going to be in the same line of business as them, um, they feel like they have what it takes as well. Because I think it's easy for people to get into that old school hiring process. So Brad, really quick, could you just highlight what are our processes to get to uh, the point of hiring somebody? How many steps do they go through all those things? I think it's amazing. For sure, Cam. And this is something that I agree, this company has done a fantastic job with our HR group, with our team members, et cetera, who have all had a vested interest in this. And they all obviously want to have great talent working with them. So to start with, we do ask the candidates to do a video recording, which just gives us a sense of how they come across, how they present, how well they're able to handle themselves. So that's our first screen. From that group, we then select candidates for meeting with our first group of folks, which is the peer group. So if they were going to be a a client service administrator in this case, then we would set them up with our other CSAs who have expertise and kind of know what it takes to be successful in those roles. The best of those then get passed on to hiring managers who then ask questions more specifically to what I'm looking for in that position. And then finally, the leadership interviews, and we do our best to, quote unquote, scare people away, compel, repel based on here's our values and just making sure that they clearly understand that these are hire, fire, 
promote, raise kind of things that, and that done well is going to be great for you in your career and done poorly. Or if this isn't who you are, then this is probably not the right place for you. So that's a high level. And, and one mm-hmm. thing, part of that, which helps all those team members with their questioning is the personality profile where they are able to look at that and say, ah, we know that in the, the CSA role, these skills, this wiring is important and they have that or they don't. And they're able to ask questions very specific to those gaps or those strengths. Yeah, no, I think that process really proves itself when that first hire comes on, they already feel familiar with the team. They've met so many people, they've got to know them already. I feel like it's such an easier transition for that person because of the process. The other thing that I always find interesting is how in the past you talked about your approach of sourcing talent. I love it. And I want you to talk a little bit more about it. How do you prospect for talent? Yes, for me, Cam, this really is a 24-7 thing. You, I'm always looking for great talent everywhere. So example, we had a quarterly meeting at a inner city church and at a coffee break, I went out to use the restroom, grab a coffee. And I saw a young lady who was diligently studying and a bunch of financial information at one of the desks. And so I stopped by and engaged her and she was very articulate, bright, and by the way, was studying for exams relevant in our space. And so of course... I was impressed with her and asked her to send me her resume because that's just an example of when I need somebody in that spot, here's somebody I bumped into, why go spend a bunch of extra time looking if you run into people who might be a great fit every day. And with that, I'm very intentional. I have a talent folder in my email and my outlook and that's where that goes. So she sends me her resume, it goes in there. And then when we have a posting like we do today, by the way, then we obviously have a great start with a group of folks who we've already run into personally, who made a positive impression and might be a great fit for us. Yeah. I love that. I think that's great. And it, I think inside of medical, especially there's so many opportunities for, I mean, between conferences, uh, between local get togethers with medical associations, there's so many opportunities to rub shoulders with people that could be your next best hire. So always staying really, really focused and looking out for those people. That's key. Well, and as Brad said, people that have worked with you in the past as well, people that you've worked with in the past, you never know when an opportunity may come around for you to bring that person over to your practice. Maybe you worked in a hospital setting and there is some kind of non-solicit and then that period ends, you need to hire and that person's top of mind because you have that file. I love it. Absolutely. Or also, for example, Lauren, we've been able to source talent from folks, for example, that your parents knew and made a very great impression. So Mm -hmm. if it's not you personally, that person's worked for you. If there's somebody else who you trust, especially judge of talent, another just great way to do that. Yeah. Social networks have helped us with that. Just thinking when we do have a job opening, we usually try to have our team share it on social media with their networks. And then something else I've always appreciated, Brad, is that your talent file is diverse. I think you're intentional about making sure that you represent diversity because you do believe in building a diverse team. And that starts with a diverse sourcing of talent. Absolutely. And that's something you're right, Lauren. It's super important. I think as we mentioned, not only just your wiring, but also just your background, your experiences, super important because we we deal with clients who often aren't exactly like me or you. And so having somebody on the team that might understand their perspective is super important. And just, again, part of being successful, we do this all because one, it's the right thing to do, but two, because we want to be successful in our business. And I do believe that's super important. Yeah, that's great. So something else that I have learned from you, Brad, I feel like this whole conversation is things that I've learned from you over the past few years, building a great team doesn't end with making quote the right hire, right? So you can nail it, get the best hire for the position and you still have to develop that talent, which takes time and energy. I'm very busy. I always have 17 different things going on. And, uh, that doesn't even, that doesn't hold a candle to most of the doctors here who are listening and managing so many different things with their practice and home life and all of that. So can you talk a little bit about how we can think about developing talent and not just talent development, but also how do we do that in a way that seems palatable given very busy demanding schedules? 
Yeah, this is clearly a huge challenge because as throughout my career, I've been in a lot of office settings and we have formal meetings and things like that. But in my orthopedic career, I've seen firsthand that if a orthopedic surgeon, for example, has 10 minutes free, they're going to do something like, I don't know, spend it with their spouse or putting food into their body for sustenance. So here, this is a super difficult, challenging one for our orthopedic surgeon clients, as well as a lot of our other doctors, because we do, we recognize how busy you are. So to me, I've thought about this and the ones that I've seen do it really well are the ones that use times when they do have some dead space or free time. So for example, an orthopedic surgeon that has 10 minutes at the scrub sink, if they wanted to spend that time being very intentional, delivering feedback, I'm a big fan of the one minute manager, which literally is all you need to deliver. Hey, I love it when you insert following specific example, or boy, it would be even better if this was this way. And so just delivering that feedback on an ongoing basis, one, and then two, I do think maybe once a month, once every three months or so getting down and just having a formal back and forth is really important. And again, whether that's at lunch in the hospital or coffee before something like that. I think it's super important to pour into your people for them to know that your their development's important to you. If others look at your organization and see that you take developing your people seriously and holding on to great talent, they're going to want to be part of that. And that's another great way to bring on talent. Yeah. And I think you mentioned the, the one minute manager that is such a quick read. <laughs> so for anyone who does audiobooks, I'm sure it's a very short listen. It is a very quick read and is an excellent way to just be constantly giving the right feedback to develop people in bite sizes <laughs> rather than have to make these bigger chunk investments of time. So I think that's a great recommendation. Something you said to me actually just yesterday, Brad, as we were talking about a situation, you said absent feedback, your mind immediately assumes the worst. And I think that is something that stuck out to me. You know, if I'm guessing about whether or not you like something a certain way or whether or not you are pleased with how I'm handling a certain situation or how I'm delivering service to patients or whatever, then I'm going to assume maybe that you're not happy with me. And it could in fact be the exact opposite. You could be saying nothing Mm -hmm. to me because you're overwhelmingly happy. And yet my mind goes to the worst place. And I might even be, there's a huge shortage (laughs) in um, the medical space right now. I could probably get another job if I think that maybe you're not satisfied with what I'm doing and I'm not getting that feedback from you on how to do better. Absolutely true. I think all of us, even when we see the results and they appear to be in the right direction, absent that ongoing positive feedback. And that's all it takes is just, Hey, again, we got together last month and I love what you're doing. You are fantastic. There's so little I can add that just keep doing what you're doing and please stay with me. I love the work you're doing, for example, but also then as you're delivering that feedback and showing that you're committed and you want to see them develop and grow in their career, it gives you the space to hear how you're doing as well. It could be that you love their work and you're gruff when you see them in your morning cases and they think they attribute that to them. And then maybe I got to do something else versus maybe you're not a morning person, for example. So I agree. I think the best way to eliminate that lack of clarity and just make sure that people understand that they're valued is to let them know that with specifics on the things they're doing great. I love it. Yeah. I think that's one of the most powerful things that I experienced here with people like you, Brad, is um, supervisors, coaches asking, what can I do better to make you better and knowing that it stops with them. So I think even taking those few minutes really will pay dividends long-term and, you know, back to the values and what prompts us or what we look for in a potential hire. I think that's one of the biggest foundations here at Vestia. So I think what's tougher to think of is obviously hiring, but also firing around potentially a miss in the core values. So can you tell me just a little bit about that? How do you approach it? As far as the value adherence? Yeah. So to me, it really is I've been part of some amazing organizations and even side places like Johnson and Johnson, where they have the credo and the majority of the populace lives with that. There's always going to be manager here or there who's in the bell curve on the low end. And so I think it's so important to 
always call out the pluses and the minuses. Again, just from a feedback perspective, from a development, if you're doing something great, you need to know that. And when you get sideways with the values, that's where if that's left unchecked, it's no longer your value. The, the value is now the one you want or the one you don't want because those are both tolerated. And so I think it's super important to make all your hiring decisions, make all your retention or termination decisions, make all your promotions, et cetera. The more those link up to measurements and pay, the more impactful they are for sure. And I've seen that. That's mm. again, one of the things I learned from Jack Welch, not him personally, but his organization when I was there was they were so committed to measurement and pay tying to things that were important to the company that that just is what the way that the the culture was. And so it was really tied to the values and that, that made them come to life. Yeah, that's powerful. Obviously it's incenting the right behaviors. Um, that same thing, compel, repel. So I think that's extremely powerful. I, I think it's just easy when times are tough, things are busy. It's easy just to stick someone in a place if you need someone, but eventually you're going to have to deal with that. And usually it's better to deal with it in the front end, making sure that you hire based on values versus trying to fix somebody. Like you said, you can't, they're wired certain ways. So I've always appreciated that. I think it's very powerful. Absolutely. And to add on to that, Cameron, the letting that go, the longer you let that go, the more you're at risk for losing your best talent. So I've learned that you never can do that soon enough. And to be fair to the individual, the sooner that they know that they're not adhering to that, the better opportunity they have to correct that. Early in my career, I wasn't the same magnificent manager that you guys have credited. To be fair, I'm, I'm still learning even at my, my advanced age, but I had an employees where my first two employees, I saved up all their feedback for the end of the year review. And that was super, I have, I didn't want to do that at all because it was one opportunity and a year's worth of stuff versus any of that had that been delivered one minute manager style along the way would have been way more healthy for both of us. How do you approach that conversation, Brad? I'm curious if you find, cause I, I, it sticks out to me what you say. It's like, if you tolerate mediocrity, not only are you endorsing it in a way, but you could also be causing a great frustration among your top performers when you're letting that kind of stuff go. So how would you mention getting together maybe monthly or something like that? Do you give chances? Is it an all or nothing? What do you think about that? That's a great, great question, Lauren. And so for, especially for correcting discussions, I think there's a couple of things that are really important. One is timeliness. And so letting things go, it's way less fresh in the person's mind. So I think when you see something to say, Hey, and I've had, again, I had a really great manager, Tim Hassett was his name at GE who I had just gotten done. I was a bit flippant in one of my presentations and he grabbed me afterwards and said, Hey, can I see you for a minute? And he pulled me aside out of the, out of the public eye and kind of said, Hey, this could have been done better. And here's exactly how I would have handled that. So fantastic for me. It catches it right then. I'm, Oh, I nod my head. I get it. Right. So timeliness, super important. Second part of that, which again, Tim did a great job with is praise in public and correct in private. And so those discussions are really best handled one-on-one -on -one away from others. I've seen it done publicly. And that all you're going to do is have the entire organization say, I don't want to be a part of an organization where I'm publicly torn down. And that's just not okay in my mind. So, you know, praise in public, correct in private, and then specifics. So timeliness in private and very specific. Here is the example of this. Here's what, here's how I perceive that. Here's the expected fix. And so start with that as a verbal one-on-one -on -one discussion. And you would expect the person to acknowledge that, understand, yep, I got it. And then if it persists, that's when you get more, hey, I'm going to send you this email and copy file and that we talked about this. I expect this to get better. If it still persists or there's denial, there's lack of efficacy that I can change this, or I disagree with you. And it's something that, especially if it's a something that has to do with values, then it's something that just has to be fixed. And that's where we get serious about a 90 day plan. At the end of that, we're going to agree to move ahead if it's fixed or agree to part because we just clearly don't see our values in the same way. Yeah. So that 90 day, like a 90 day window sort of to Absolutely. figure that out. Absolutely. 
Yeah, that's good. I, it, it strikes me as you're talking about all of this, you're hiring. We talked about that being intentional, but also just this ongoing process of develop development and feedback does have to be intentional in whatever way can work for that busy doctor schedule, because absent that, I think you probably, there are probably problems waiting to happen, right? Or issues waiting to emerge if they aren't there now. And so I think the more that you can find some kind of process, some kind of cadence that works for you, the better off you're ultimately going to be. And the more practice growth you're going to see as a result, because then it's just a machine that works. Right on. To me, this is a calendar test. If it's in your calendar, it's something that's important to you and development is important to me. So it's in my calendar. Yeah. And what, yeah, like you said, in whatever way works for that context, you touched on this earlier, but I want to expand on it a little bit. So something that I know I have found helpful as a leader, I know you have asked this of, of me in a leadership position is getting feedback from my team, from those people that report to me so that I can understand how I'm being perceived and where I can do better or where I need to level up myself. You use that example of the gruff in the morning. That's me. I'm not a morning person. And so if you catch me first thing in the morning, you have a question about a situation. Um, Actually, Cameron, I just did this to you the other day. I realized Mm -hmm. I was responding very short in some instant messages back and forth to you. And I just clarified really quickly. I said, Hey, this is just, it's the morning. I have a million things going on. This has nothing to do with you or how I feel about this situation. (laughs) So Brad, can you talk a little bit about how do you go about asking for feedback and how do you do it in a way that you want, that you're able to get genuine feedback as opposed to just, no, 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 you're doing great. I've got nothing. Great question. And, and part of this is a, is a time and vulnerability thing. So the, number one, if you're new to a position and you, if you tell your whole team, boy, I'd really love you to tell me after the next couple of weeks, how I'm doing, you're probably going to get very shallow information because nobody knows yet if that means you're going to terminate them or completely ignore it, et cetera. But to me, it really is understanding thanking the the individual for the gift of feedback and telling them what you're going to do about it. And just over time, especially if you open yourself up, if you are committing the time on your calendar for their development, if you show, I am sincerely interested in seeing your growth. I understand where you want to get in your career. And we're going to review this on this routine basis. And if you've earned that, it's also, it's the emotional bank account thing where you've demonstrated you care about them truly as an individual. They then learn to trust you. They give you some maybe benign feedback and see how you handle that. Once you've done that, then the team really will open up and start giving you the the true stuff where they'll come in and close my door and say, boy, this is something that I can't believe we're doing this. Do we really want to do it this way? And and that's the great feedback because that's, that's how we get better as an organization. Yeah. It strikes me too, with a lot of the physicians that we work with, yes, there is this kind of leadership management in a professional setting, but a lot of doctors have household employees as well. You have a housekeeper, you have a nanny, people like that, that I think some of these concepts can absolutely apply. You know, that one minute manager, even if it's people that you're interacting with in passing, but there are things that you really like about what they're doing or things that you really would like them to do a little bit differently. I think that probably could be really powerful. And again, just ultimately make your life easier and make things run more effectively. Absolutely. I hate to share personal examples, but we did have an example of a nanny that we had kids that were allergic to cats and we asked her not to have them around her cats and they wound up around her cats. So that, for example, we had to address that for ex- just to make sure that that was clear that that wasn't meeting our expectations or she wouldn't know that. Yeah, no, I yeah. think that's a great example. So as we wrap up, Brad, something that's become kind of a tradition for us here is just learning about your personal values, some of the things that are important to you. So our motto here at Abestia is we want to help our clients achieve wealth that matters. So I'm curious, in your opinion, what does wealth that matter mean to you? So Cam, my wealth that matters is, and this has been consistent for a very long time, is my is my faith, my family, and my work. And when those three are all in a good place is where I'm really thriving as an individual, as a leader, as a husband, as a father, as a friend. 
And so to me, those three things I try to dedicate and again, get back to the calendar test. Am I spending the right amount of time? And, and clearly, while I would love to spend 40 hours a week with my wife, that doesn't quite happen versus 40 hours I spend at work. But making sure that I do have my calendar, I have my wife as, as a time with Krista on my calendar. So she's important to me and it, it shows up the same with my faith. And then obviously the things that work that matter show up on my calendar. So that to me, those three things, faith, family, and work all in a good place or where I'm doing great. That's awesome. You got to have a way to be able to judge yourself, see how you're ranking and how you're doing as far as just to your own core values and what's important. And I think it's only when you have that in line and you're well-founded in that, that you'll be able to help coach some others. So I can tell that's, that's why you've been able to coach people like Lauren and I, because you're very steadfast in what's important to you. So really appreciate all the insight, Brad. This is far more leadership education that I guarantee any physician has ever had. Uh, Definitely more than uh, a lot of what Lauren and I have had. And so this is just the tip of the iceberg, but a couple of just quick uh, bullet points to summarize. So the first thing is just understanding why do you need to do this and why do you need to be intentional about building a great team? The first thing is understand we're all selfish, unfortunately, just wired that way, but what's in it for me? So you want to surround yourself by people that you enjoy, um, that people that support what you're doing, that buy into the cause, and it's overall good business sense. So taking the time to make sure that you, number one, know your values, number two, articulate your values, and let that drive your hiring process. At the end of the day, you want to include the entire team, if possible, in the decision-making. And that's the easiest way to make sure you're hiring the right person, but then you can retain great talent at the same time. Never stop looking for great talent. So I think it's so easy. We get uh, in a good state of just comfort and we just stop that hunt. Well, when times are tough or when you really need someone desperately, it's so easy to be able to just pick up the phone, look in your email, wherever you store that and say, and this was a PA that I met before. I was really, really impressed with them. I'm going to give them a call. It's really, really powerful to do that. And then the last thing that I really took away was feedback is critical. If you don't say anything, people assume the worst. And we know how busy you are, but you're a busy doctor, but even if in one minute increments, if you take time to praise in public, correct them in private and be very clear and articulate what they're doing well and what needs to change, it's going to be the best possible solution for both parties involved. Uh, and no one's left guessing. And I think that's what's helped us here at Vestia Thrive. And I really hope that everyone listening in will be able to take away some nuggets as well. Brad, anything I missed as a good summary? Anything you want to add? I think that was a fantastic wrap up, Cameron. I, I appreciate it. And I will honestly offer out anybody that has any questions, would like to know more or my philosophy on any of this. I am wide open. Hit me up on LinkedIn and I'm happy to take a couple minutes and share. Absolutely. And I think we'll also include some of the links of the common tools that we use during our hiring process that we, the the insights, for example, to help evaluate the next team hire, uh, make sure they're a good fit. So we appreciate your time, Brad. We appreciate everybody listening in. Make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And until next time, take care and stay safe. Thank you for listening to the Doctor's Eyes Only podcast. We hope today's conversation advanced your journey to wealth that matters. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. We'll see you next time. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Vesti Advisors, LLC. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. It should not be construed as legal or tax advice and is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified attorney or tax advisor. This information is not an offer or a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Investing involves risk, including risk of loss. Before investing, you should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses associated with investment products. Investment decisions should be made based off an individual's goals, time horizon, and tolerance for risk. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Diversification and asset allocation do not ensure a profit or guarantee against loss. Consult your financial professional before making any investment decisions. Investment advisory services offered through Vestia Personal Wealth Advisors, Vestia Retirement Planning Consultants, and Vestia Advisors, LLC. 
Securities offered through Osdell Financial Partners, Inc., 5187 Utica Ridge Road, Davenport, Iowa, 52807, 563 Member FINRA SIPC. Vestia Personal Wealth Advisors, Vestia Retirement Plan Consultants, Vestia Advisors, LLC, and Osdell Financial Partners, Inc. are independently owned and operated.